You know, I don't know how you uh, came to know Jesus Christ personally, uh, whom to know is life eternal. I hope that you've made that life-changing decision. If you haven't, I hope you'll make it today because everything, somebody say, is, is this a good spot for an amen? Uh, when you come to know Jesus Christ, that changes everything, amen. right? It really does. It just changes everything. And, and uh, so if you've had that uh, experience, then... Um, uh, it, it, it may or may not be that you have a full a sense of uh, where you are tonight. Now, do you understand that you're in uh, an, uh, an evangelical, a non-denominational, I might say a conservative, uh, evangelical, uh, non-denominational uh, uh, church? And uh, just to put that in a little bit of a context, the Church of Jesus Christ is about 2,000 years old. And uh, it started off with one church, uh, started by the apostles, and then as it spread by about the year 1000, the only obvious church after a thousand years was the Catholic Church, though there were uh, pockets of uh, what we would call gospel-believing uh, people, but illiteracy was so great, it was uh, really a very, very different scenario than uh, what it is now. If you go forward, maybe another 500 years uh, later, uh, there was... Uh, the Catholicism and something called Eastern Orthodoxy that had broken off from Catholicism. And starting in about the 1500s, there was something called Protestantism, which was all of the people who pulled out of uh, the Catholic Church. So now, if everything was as it was then, there would only be three kinds of churches. Catholic churches, Protestant churches, and um, Eastern Orthodox churches. And we do have all of those, uh, but something that happened about... I would say maybe about 50 years ago, because of, how are you doing with the history lesson? You know, all right? Listen to this. Because of Protestantism's disdain for hierarchy, which means authority outside the church, uh, because of Protestantism's disdain for hierarchy and ecclesiastical control, uh, that's why there's hundreds of different kinds of uh, Protestant churches. About 50 years ago, after World War II, I guess that would be 60 years ago now, um, there was a major split uh, in Protestantism. And uh, the mainline churches, the kind of original sort of, I mean, call out the name of a mainline Protestant church. Okay, Methodist and what else? Uh, Presbyterian and Baptist and Lutheran. Yeah, for sure, all of those. Um, Get this, um, there was a, uh, the mainline churches embraced something after the Second World War uh, to one degree or another called a neo-orthodoxy. And neo-orthodoxy taught that the only part of the Bible that is God's word is the part that speaks to you. And uh, so they denied the virgin birth. Uh, they denied the deity of Christ in many instances. They certainly de uh, denied the uh, substitutionary atonement of Christ, the necessity of the new birth, uh, the reality of a literal hell. Uh, most of all, what they denied was the authority and the infallibility and the in inerrance, uh, we would say the inerrancy, uh, of God's word. Now, there were uh, two splinters then uh, that came off of mainline Protestantism. Uh, one is evangelicalism. This is an evangelical church. And uh, the uh, evangelical church affirmed the things that mainline Protestantism denied. So they denied the virgin birth. Do we believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ? All right. Uh, they denied the deity of Jesus Christ. Do we believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, that he's God? All right. They denied uh, the uh, necessity of the new birth and the substitutionary atonement and the uh, authority and infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, do we affirm those things? Yes, we do. And uh, a another additional group uh, that split off is called not uh, evangelicalism, but fundamentalism. And fundamentalism affirms the same things, but they, uh, these are broad terms, but they additionally added a, a code of conduct uh, that was extra biblical. It was um, evangelicalism rejected fundamentalism because fundamentalism had, you know, you could call it, um, you know, how many of you grew up in a fundamentalist church? Did you, any of you? So, you know, the filthy five and the, the, you know, the seven deadly sins and the dirty dozen. And, and these are the things we don't do. And we don't smoke. We don't chew. We don't go with girls that do. You know, we, we don't, 
you know, we got, we got a whole list of things that are not mentioned in the Bible in any way, uh, but uh, were a huge, huge part of the fundamentalism that many of us <coughs> uh, grew up with. All right. Uh, with that as a background, uh, the evangelical church affirms what mainline Protestantism, for the most part, there are exceptions, there are wonderful gospel preaching, Methodist churches, and all the rest of that. Um, certainly there are many, many evangelical Presbyterian churches, so it's not a one-size-fits-all, but the ones that embrace neo-orthodoxy and deny the things that I've already stated, evangelicalism reject, uh, uh, accepts what they deny, and evangelicalism rejects what they add. So they, uh, mainline Protestantism, um, denies scriptures that we will not deny, and a fundamentalism adds to scriptures things that we will not add. And here we find ourselves in the middle of something called uh, evangelicalism. But as we uh, stand now uh, well into the second uh, decade of a new millennialism, a new millennium, uh, some pretty unbelievable things have happened. And I understand that most of you who are listening are not students of evangelicalism, but you're part of it. And uh, what has happened is, is that evangelicalism has become uh, financially prosperous, methodologically successful, growing the biggest churches with the biggest numbers of people. Um, but while that has uh, been happening, rejecting legalism and neo-orthodoxy, evangelicalism has been drifting more and more and more away from uh, the biblical parameters called uh, holiness and more and more into what I would call license. And uh, while legalism, adding things to the Bible, is a problem, um, not a big danger of legalism, not in our church, not in most evangelical churches. We're all, we all say we're afraid of legalism, but we actually reject that, refusing to see uh, how far uh, we have drifted uh, into license. We certainly preach and believe uh, the importance of personal holiness and living in a way that honors God. Um, the problem is, is that when you compare yourself to the other boats in the water, you lose sight of how far uh, you have drifted uh, from shore, okay? And, and a shore, uh, in terms of this matter of holiness, is the nature and the character of God himself. Uh, the God who said, be holy, uh, for I am holy. And I think we would be uh, well served uh, to go to a passage of scripture uh, that reveals not just the holiness of God, but listen, but the holiness of God as the central defining uh, character uh, of his person. So take your Bibles, if you uh, would please, and turn with me to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. Now, I don't mean to be critical. I'm so happy that you are here uh, tonight. But let me just say that when the preacher says we're going to Isaiah, if you had a better handle on Isaiah, you, you, you would cheer. Or maybe, maybe, maybe you were uh, wanting to cheer, but you just didn't uh, know how that would go over. So, um, um, hey, turn to Isaiah 6. Now... <laughs> Now, here's why, here's why uh, you're so excited about this. Um, Isaiah was called to minister to the aff affluent uh, leaders of his day. Uh, Isaiah preached the holiness of God during the reign, get this, of four different kings. Imagine, uh, I don't know how many presidents I've been a pastor under, but I suppose I could count it up. But Isaiah was preaching to affluent people under four different kings. He ministered without compromise. Uh, in a day of moral decline, uh, from his lips, Isaiah poured forth dignified oratory 
like the world had never heard uh, or, or seen uh, before. Uh, his Hebrew is the finest and the most elegant and eloquent uh, language in the entire Old Testament. Um, I would suggest to you that Isaiah is the greatest uh, of the prophets. Uh, while Jonah ran, while Jeremiah wept, while Habakkuk cried how long, uh, Isaiah stood and proclaimed the righteous uh, majesty of God and the coming Messiah. From Isaiah's pen uh, came our most treasured prophecies about Christ 800 years before Jesus came uh, to this world. Now, how did Isaiah become such a, a pure and powerful and prophetic spokesman uh, for God? Well, um, the answer is, is that on the day God called him, he gave Isaiah really an unparalleled vision of his own uh, holy nature. And it is a vision that we uh, desperately need in the church today. So um, let's uh, just kind of jump into this. Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse 1. And uh, let's start with this main thought. Uh, God is infinite holiness. God is infinite uh, holiness. Now, by infinite, we mean unmeasurable, unfathomable, unalterable. Notice in Isaiah 6, 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah writes, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Let's take that a phrase at a time. We believe that every word in God's word matters. Amen. So, um... In the, in the year that King Uzziah died, that's about 740 B.C., and uh, Uzziah reigned 52 years. He, get that. Just think about that for a second. That's like uh, Don Stevens down in Rosemont. I mean, I mean, forever. He was, for 52 years, he was uh, the king. And, and so just think about that and what that would mean. And uh, actually, he was uh, the king, a fixture in the nation of Israel. Leprosy took his life, and uh, the nation was in great turmoil. Imagine if we'd had the same president for 52 years. And all of a sudden, you opened up the paper, and it said, uh, the, the president is dead. I mean, everything's up. What, what now? What, I've never, we've never had, man, most people would say, I've never lived when someone else wasn't. And if you get the sense of that, that's what was happening uh, in the nation of Israel. That's why he writes, in the year that King Uzziah died. Notice, what are the next three words? I saw the Lord. That's pretty awesome right there. I mean, I mean what happened to you? I, I, I saw the Lord. Whether waking or sleeping in a vision or a dream, uh, we're not told. But Isaiah was supernaturally transported to the throne room of God. And, and he got to see uh, the very uh, nature or person of God. Now, uh, John 12, 41. Can you, can you, I just turn there and read something to you really quick, really quick. I bet you can't even get there in time. Just, I already, I'm already there. John 12, 41 uh, says uh, this. Um, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. And they're talking about Jesus here. And they're referencing the passage that we're studying. So um, back to Isaiah 6. Uh, who did he see? Um, John 12, 41 indicates that Isaiah was actually gazing upon the pre-incarnate Christ. That is, Isaiah gazed upon the second person of the Trinity. Now, I, I don't want to quibble about this if your belief is different, but I've been studying the Bible for a good while now. And I would just say to you that I believe, I believe, um, that Jesus Christ, uh, the God-man Jesus Christ, since the incarnation, is the only God you will ever see. Ever. Through all of eternity. There's only one God. Eternally existing in three persons. But here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. There isn't three gods. There's one God existing in three persons. You're like, that makes my head explode. I agree. 
But the Bible teaches the Trinity again and again and again. All right? But John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen the Father. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Hebrews 1 says of Jesus that He is the radiance of the glory of God. That He is the exact imprint of His nature. When I was teaching through the book of Revelation, I won't go into it uh, tonight, but when I was teaching through the book of Revelation, I believe that, that uh, some passages describe Jesus Christ at the right hand of God the Father. But in Revelation, it seems as though, almost as though they're on the same throne because they are the same, uh, the same uh, uh, unity uh, in the midst of this uh, trinity. So one God eternally existing in three persons. All that to say this, I believe that it is the pre-incarnate Christ on the throne that Isaiah is gazing upon. The creator, according to Colossians 1. The one who spoke and the worlds were formed. Now, I've taught many times... Uh, including in our series on Psalm 25, Psalm 34, uh, that God's personal covenant name, uh, rightly understood, uh, is Yahweh. And I've told you that when you see it in your Bible, capitalized, capital L-O-R-D, all capitalized, that that's speaking of uh, Yahweh, uh, Jesus Christ, a pre-incarnate in the Old Testament. How many people have heard me teach that before? And I would point out to you here, that's not uh, what we have. Notice that the L-O-R-D is not capitalized. When he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, lowercase O-R-D. Now, this isn't his personal name. This is his title. What he's saying is, is I saw the ruler. I saw the ruler. I saw the sovereign. I saw the king. He's talking about his title. He's talking about his position. He's talking about his majestic grandeur. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now, I love this part. I, I love it all. Um, what's he doing? And I talk about that all the time. What's he doing? He's sitting down. Why is he sitting down? Because he can all right? He doesn't have a reason to stand up. Uh, I love to say that uh, um, the Lord uh, rules the universe with his feet up. Notice that he is seated on the throne, not pacing back and forth, not wringing his hands, not figuring out what he's going to do next. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting, sitting uh, upon a throne, all right? And, and he's uh, resting uh, now, he is, he is not forming a plan. He's not working out a puzzle. He's not figuring out what to do next. He is uh, ruling with ease. He's not taxed. He's not maxed. He's not stressed. He's infinite. He could have made a thousand universes and not be more strained than he is in ruling over this one. He's the Lord. And, and this is an, an, an awesome uh, uh, reality-altering uh, picture. And of course, um, he's seated on a throne. And uh, I kind of like the picture of that little chorus we've been singing. Um, he can do it. Yes, he can. He will prove it. Our God can. It's just such an awesome thought to think of the Lord as Isaiah saw him revealed. Sitting on a throne and then, um, um, see there, a high and lifted up. Not just any throne. Uh, some translations say a lofty and exalted. Now, the main reason that the church has lost its moral vision is that it has lost its high and exalted view of God. Listen, embracing the comfort of his nearness, we have lost the compelling force of his transcendence. Can I say it again? Embracing the comfort of his nearness, 
Oh, pastor, give us another series on God's love. I, give me another series on his, his compassion. And all of these things are wonderful truths. But preferring the comfort of his nearness, we have not heard enough about his transcendence. And we have tended to lower God and make him in our image. And humanize God, as it were. God is not an old codger with a white beard. He's not the man upstairs. He's, he's not Big Daddy. He is ineffable glory. And he dwells in unapproachable light. And no one can see God and live. And our God is a consuming fire. Now, these are the things that the Bible says about God. And this is what Isaiah saw and it altered him. And maybe we would be uh, less casual about our behavior choices if we remembered who this God that we love and serve uh, really is. George Barna did a study on the behaviors of evangelicals. Interesting, uh, the statistics are remarkably similar between believers and non-believers. 19% 19, <clears throat> 19 of believers uh, watch MTV, the music channel, in the past week. 24% of non-believers. 27% of evangelicals have been uh, divorced. Very similar for non-believers. 23% of believers bought a lottery ticket in the past week. 27% of non-believers. More non-believers give money to homeless people. Exact same number, 70% uh, subscribe to what we might consider questionable television channels. 76% of evangelicals uh, watched a movie R-rated or higher in the past three months. 87% of non-believers. It's really interesting. Barna goes on and says, interestingly, the stumbling block for the church is not its theology. That's not what the world is stumbling over, not what we believe. Their stumbling block is over our failure to apply what we say we believe in compelling ways. Those who have turned to Christianity and churches seeking the truth and meaning have left empty-handed and confused by the apparent inability of Christians themselves to implement the principles uh, that they profess. A man I uh, appreciate greatly, um, uh, David Wells, uh, has written a book called Losing Our Virtue, Why the Church Must Recover Its Moral Vision. And in it, uh, David Wells says this, listen, Evangelical churches have grown in numbers and size. Ministries have been developed that did not exist. Scholars abound. Libraries have been expanded. Seminaries are numerous. Politicians take note. But along with this astounding growth, there has nevertheless come a hollowing out of evangelical conviction. An erosion of character to the point that today no discernible ethical differences are evident in the behavior when those claiming to be born again are compared with their secular neighbors. And then this, I just think this is really interesting, that as these churches have grown, as these things have happened, um, Wells harkens back to 25 years ago to the start of his ministry when he was a seminary professor. He says, at a time when you could still use the word theology in a church without having to reach for the smelling salts. As in everybody would immediately faint because what was being talked about was not readily usable to me right now. We don't want to build a robust theology. We want a uh, drive-through uh, sermon with a quick uh, inspiration. And we wonder why our faith fails us in the hardest of times. 
Well, let's go back now for the remainder of this uh, study to Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, <clears throat> and the train of his robe filled the temple. I love that part. The train of his robe. The train of a robe. Ladies, anybody have, ladies, anybody have a, a kind of a train on your a wedding dress when you got married? H hands up if you had that. A good, nice, nicely done. It was a little bit kind of dragging out there behind you. Do you know why? I noticed that you don't have one of those on at church tonight. Well, why'd you wear one on your wedding day? Well, the reason you did is because um, the train of a robe, it's a symbol of honor. And uh, the longer the train of the robe, um, the greater uh, the honor. And you wouldn't show up at church with that on, but when, when you wore that in your wedding, everyone think, of course she's wearing it, it's her day, right? It was a symbol of, of, of you being honored. Uh, can anybody call to mind uh, the picture of uh, the coronation of Queen Elizabeth? She's been a queen now for a very long time. Uh, but when she was uh, coronated, I uh, see them there carrying uh, the train of her robe. I mean, it went down the aisle and almost out the back door uh, of Westminster Abbey. That's how long her train was. I mean, it takes how many people are carrying it in that picture? I mean, who does she think she is? The queen of... Uh, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> she is the queen of England. And get this. The train of her robe is the symbol of her splendor. The longer the train, the greater the honor. Now look again at what Isaiah saw. Notice at the end of verse 1. On a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe, what's it say? It filled the temple, <laughs> down the aisle, and back and forth and back and forth, doubling and redoubling until the symbol of God's splendor filled the temple where he was. Too much? Too much? Undeserving? I think not. I think a perfect description of ultimate, infinite honor. And it's like, so he, so he sees the Lord... And it's like, he's, he's, he, I can almost, so I saw him and he's on his throne and the train of his robe and high and lifted up and, and, and then he's like, let me tell you about the angels. And these kids didn't have anything else he can think of to say. And so now he goes to describing around the throne, verse two, above him, that's the Lord, <clears throat> above him stood the seraphim. I love that. Seraphim, angels. And, and what are they doing? They're standing, ever standing to serve the seated sovereign. The Hebrew here for seraphim is, is literally uh, burning ones. Seraph is, is the word. Countless burning throngs. And now he describes them. Above him uh, stood the seraphim. Each had, how many? Each had six wings. This is, getting, this is getting awesome. Each had six wings. Now just think, there, God is on the throne right now. Right, turn to your neighbor and say right now. And, and these burning seraph are there in his presence. Tell them again. Right now. They're there right now. And, and get this. They have these six wings. Man, what do they need six wings for? What are they, what are they, what are they doing with their six wings? Notice, um, with two, he, describing an individual seraph now, with two he covered his, his, his face. Why? lest he gaze on infinite holiness and be consumed in a moment, incinerated. So with two, he covers his face. 
With two, he covers his feet. Yeah. Lest, lest God see me. I, I don't want to see him. I don't want him to see me. That, that sense of unutterable uh, holiness. And with two, he uh, flew. Just keeping himself there in that standing position with two wings. It's interesting. Uh, four wings for relating to God. I, I, I don't want to see him, and I don't, and I don't, and I don't want him to see me. Four wings for relating to God. Two wings for serving God. I think there's something in that. And how often we spend so much of our energy serving God and so little of our energy just being in worshipful relationship with God. Well, anyway, all three of these verbs, covered, covered, and flew, are continuous action. Their motion is ceaseless as they fulfill the bidding of Almighty God. Verse 3, here it goes. And one called out to another and said, picture two lines. I'm picturing two lines of these seraph going out as far as the eye can see uh, from the throne in the presence of God, standing, hovering in place as it were, and calling out back and forth. And one called out to another that's an antiphonal chorus. I'm always after the worship team to sing antiphonally. Um, that's where part of the congregation sings part of the song, and the other part of the congregation sings the other part of the song. It's so alive and dynamic when that's happening, and that's what's happening here. Um, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth uh, is full of of his glory. Now, um, let's uh, start um, just with uh, the word holy. Um, it's it's a, kind of a churchy word in a way. And um, it just means uh, separate, uh, set apart. When the Bible uh, says that God is holy, it's uh, telling us that he's not like us. You say, well, in what way? In every way. He's not like us. You say, well, I thought we're made in his image. Well, we may have some parallels to him, but he doesn't have many parallels to us. All right. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He is all that we could ever imagine him to be and so much more. And so God is completely separate. There is no being like him. Jot down. Exodus 15, 11. <clears throat> Who is like you, O God? Majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. Then notice this. Um, notice the repetition. Um, holy, holy, holy. Uh, the three-peat. Uh, is making a point that would be hard for us. An, an idiom of the Hebrew language is, is that emphasis is uh, showing um, a size and space and uh, a personhood. Uh, it's showing dimension. So, for example, if you said, um, I was out for a walk, and this is in Hebrew. If you said, I was out for a walk and I fell in a hole, yeah, well, I bet you got out pretty easy, you know. <clears throat> but if they would say, I was out for a walk and I fell in a whole hole. Like, oh, that's rough. Are you okay? You know, did you get out? But if you said, I was out for a walk and I fell in a hole, 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 that's how they would talk. And if they said it three times, that's just like mega to the max. You can't. Now, interesting, interesting. Only here. And only of this characteristic do we learn God is not holy. God is not holy, holy. He is holy, holy, 
holy. The repetition is, is, is communicating the, the immenseness and the all-encompassing nature of this unifying and central characteristic of God. <clears throat> Kadesh is, is the Hebrew. Kadesh. Kadesh. It's the, uh, this three thing is the strongest superlative form uh, in the Hebrew language. So back to the text, this is what they're calling out in heaven. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> and then this, the whole earth is full of his glory. And I've taught many times that God's holiness And I've, sorry about that. And I've taught many times that God's holiness is, um, you know, the central defining uh, characteristic of his nature and that God's glory is what emanates from God's presence. We don't see God. We see his glory. We see evidence. Glory is evidence that God exists in a vertical church like ours. It's all about the revealing of the glory of God, the manifest presence of God. Uh, the evidence of God's existence and his work in our midst. And so when it says here, the whole earth is full of his glory, there's no place on the earth where his glory is not seen. The heavens are declaring the glory of God and the uh, earth is showing his handiwork, the psalmist said, and uh, everywhere uh, we see it, we see his glory. Now, I'm not going to try to make you uh, say this antiphonally, but this is the song that's going on in heaven right now. And so um, let's just say that a first phrase, um, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Imagine it's being said right now. Let's, let's join the chorus. Lift up your voice and say it. Come on. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, are you satisfied? Are you satisfied with your volume? No. It takes somebody to lead. I'd love to hear somebody lead. Try that again. Holy, Come on, all together. Ready? Holy, holy. And the next line, the whole earth is full of his glory. As Isaiah saw the scene, the Lord, the throne, his robe, the burning angels, and he heard the heavenly chorus. Um, no wonder it says here, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. The foundations of the threshold trembling, and no doubt the whole uh, temple was shaking, but Isaiah now, uh, no doubt, a prostrate uh, at the doorway as holiness says, this far, no further, and, and he falls on his face, and, and um, the hymn is thunderous, shaking the temple, filling it with smoke, and, and the foundation of the thresholds shook. And now the voice of him who called out. The house was filled with smoke to quickly veil Isaiah's vision. And that, that's, there's the grace of God right there. And the smoke comes up and he can't see anything anymore. Veiling Isaiah's vision lest he be consumed in another moment by the unspeakable, unsearchable, infinite holiness of the triune God, the moral worthiness, the utter terror and majestic holiness of Almighty God. Now, that, loved ones, is a view of God uh, that we have lost in the church. We have lost our view of the highness and the holiness of God. And that's why we so seldom hear what is here in verse 5. Seeing all of this, Isaiah now speaks, verse 5, and said, uh, Woe is me! That's God! That's who He is! That's the standard! That's where the bar is set! Woe to me! I am bankrupt! I am broken, like David said in Psalm uh, 130, verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, 
Who could stand? Who here could stand in the presence of holiness? If God wrote everything down and, and held it all to your account, who would rush into his presence? I think uh, no one. He says, woe is me. That phrase, uh, woe there, um, uh, means uh, the calamity has fallen or is about to fall. If that's who God is, this is not great for me. Woe is me for, notice, for I am ruined. Um, see it there? Woe is me for I am lost, my translation says. Literally, I'm dead. I'm done for. I'm silenced. You know, draw the curtain. It's over for me. I always um, am fearful. This happens to me an amazing uh, amount of times. Um, someone will say to me, I guess because of my position, and someone will say, you know, if I ever get to meet God, you know, I'm going to tell him a couple of things. I say, well, you know, let me know when that's coming so I can be in a different room. And, 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 I mean, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You don't know what you're talking about. The arrogance of suggesting, look at Isaiah's speech. He got to meet with God. Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And that's really his... his Summary position. When you see holiness for what it is, you, you're, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. I am fallen. I am failing. I am sinful. Um, um, he is holy and I am not. Unclean. Who can speak for this God? I have unclean lips. We all have unclean lips. Things I've said, things I've done. Why, why Isaiah? Well, he tells us right there. How, how did you reach this conclusion? My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Boy, all of our silliness, all of our petty differences, all of our foolishness incinerated in a moment in the presence of of holiness. I've been preaching on themes like this for almost 30 years, and I can tell you there isn't much that makes the faces of God's people glaze over more than to say, you're going to teach on holiness. Most people treat holiness like kind of ho-hum, kind of like, Ugh. it's like medicine, you know. My wife, the stuff she's been making me drink in the cough service, it's just better to be sick. <laughs> Funny about cough syrup. Sad if we think that that's what holiness is. Somehow that, that, that holiness, far from, being, far from being something negative, it's the absence of holiness that has made us so restless and so miserable for so long. It's the substitution of other things that only cause grief and guilt and lack of fulfillment and constant searching. If, if the holiness of God could even fractionally displace our constant carnality, the joy that would flood our souls, holiness is God giving to us himself. This God who says incredibly, be holy for I am holy. And so um, God is infinite holiness. Now expounded to you, God's holiness reveals our sinfulness. And that's what we've been talking about. Woe is me for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Incredibly, this God of infinite holiness who reveals our sinfulness. Now this, thirdly, God, God calls us to holiness. 
verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. That had to be quite a moment, right? That I just, it's like a ball of fire with six wings. And here it comes. It's flying right toward Isaiah, who's feeling so sinful, so fallen, so overwhelmed, so aware of his own depravity. But this is awesome. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, the place of worship. He didn't know tongs were in the Bible, right? Just picture like, your, you know, your barbecue utensils. They got tongs in heaven. Did you know this? Were you aware of this? So he went and got some tongs. I think that's funny. But what's awesome about this is he gets a burning coal from the altar and he takes it to Isaiah. Now, why did the angelic being do this? Was it because he felt sorry for Isaiah? Was it because he decided to help Isaiah? Was it because he, he thought, you know, God's so awesome and holy and this poor guy just feels so sinful right now. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to try to help, help him out a little bit. Is that what happened? I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say that even though the text doesn't say it, I'm going to say that I'll bet they almost never do the seraphim say, I'm going to do this. I bet God will really like this. I'm going to, I'm going to say that I think they do only exactly as they're told. What do you think? So even though the text doesn't say that God told the angel to do it, the reason why it doesn't say it is because it's so patently obvious that these beings that exist to worship God don't take a breath, don't fly or flap a wing without his full endorsement that clearly this is at the direction of God the Father. And this burning coal is to burn away Isaiah's impurity. And that altar is a place of continual burning where sacrifice for sin in the Old Testament was made. And now a reminder through all of eternity of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made once for all. Let me read to you just quickly from... First Peter chapter 1, which says this, starting in verse 14. As obedient children, <clears throat> do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So God calls us to holiness, and finally, God cleanses us for holiness. Then one seraphim, Isaiah 6, 6, flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. Here it is. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Isn't that awesome? So it's like, psst, takes that and just puts it up to his lips and just 
searing, sealing, sanctifying. Psh! Your sins are taken away. Your sins are forgiven. Why would a holy God do that? For Isaiah, the altar of cleansing is looking ahead to a day when Christ, the Lamb of God, would take away the sin of the world. For us, it's looking back by faith to, day, to the day when Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, completed all of these Old Testament pictures and our sin is paid for. Why would God forgive all of our sin? A holy God. So we can go to heaven? So we don't have to worry about the future? So we can have a nicer life knowing where we're going? No. Write this in the margin of Isaiah 6. Saved for holiness. Saved for holiness. That's what we're saved for. We're saved to live in a manner worthy of the Lord. Not to tolerate ungodliness in our speech, in our conduct, in things that we set before our eyes. But to actually live a life that is fitting, that is honoring, that is reflective of. Not judging others whose behavior doesn't conform to our own expectations. But we ourselves taking seriously this God's exhortation. Be holy, for I am holy, declares the Lord. I love that picture. I find it uh, compelling, uh, even consuming. And uh, I'm working on it. And I hope you are too. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the joy of opening your word to these uh, dear people. Cause this high and exalted view of your holy nature <clears throat> to be ever before our eyes. Thank you that the whole earth is full of your glory. And we want our lives to be a reflection of the reality of who you are. So bring greater expressions of your holiness to our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for hanging around after that uh, message on Isaiah 6. Wow, that passage gets me every time in a really good way. And uh, it's Christmas time, so we're turning our attention to the uh, year-end emphasis. And uh, I'm going to be airing some teaching uh, the, from Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. As far as I know, it's never been on radio or television before, but um, it's called Christmas in Heaven. And uh, the idea is, of course, that uh, in heaven, where God is on the throne, as we've just been learning, uh, things are a lot different. I think sometimes we struggle with generosity uh, in giving gifts and all that comes with Christmas because we don't understand that the very riches of heaven are at our disposal as the blood-bought sons and daughters of our Father in heaven through faith in Jesus. And uh, so I'm going to be talking every week. I'm going to give a live teaching about uh, generosity and God's extravagant generosity toward us in Christ. And I'm going to be encouraging you to express that same thing. You know, when we open up our hearts and open up our wallets and open up our very families and possessions, there's a way that God shows up really not like at any other time. So I don't have a heavy pitch because we don't have a heavy need. But I am excited to teach you from God's Word about Christmas in heaven and uh, extravagant giving. So a little live teaching each week and then some historic teaching coming your way as well. It's going to be a great time the rest of the month. So I hope you'll set aside some time for us to tune our hearts to sing His praise together during this Christmas season. So God bless and we'll see you again next week.